All right, welcome in. New edition of the Winning Plays podcast. My name is Brian Robb. Very excited to have Taylor Snow of Celtics.com. Great reporter over there for how many years now, Taylor? How many years have you been? I'm uh, in my seventh season. Wow. Time yep. flies. But it's gone by fast. It is. And, but yeah, Taylor, he's a great follow on Twitter at Taylor C. Snow. Is that correct? Am I yep. getting that right? Uh, yep. Yeah. Taylor so if you're not following there, make sure you. You're following him. He's always tweeting out great numbers, great clips. Um, a lot of bad time. Ones. Yeah, a lot of bad ones, a lot of bad puns, terrible right. jokes. You can uh, give him plenty of crap for that. But today we had to bring him aboard because, um, listen, this uh, this Celtics team is, is rolling right now. We're recording this on a Friday, uh, straight out of the All-Star break, where the Seas really took care of business against the Brooklyn Nets on Thursday night. They've won, I believe, 10 out of 11 and 17 of 22 overall going back to the beginning of January and look like honestly the best team in the NBA for the 2022 calendar year so far so Taylor I'll start with you this what I mean health is the easy choice in terms of what has led to this turnaround um and just this this play in the last six weeks but beyond that what has kind of stood out to you the most um, from an encore perspective in terms of what has really turned this team into uh, kind of a run of the mill team to, you know, one of the East elite. Yeah. Well, I mean, building off the health, I, it's just really the continuity of that starting group. Um, I think that starting lineup, the Celtics lost their first three games of the year with that starting lineup. Um, and then since then they've gone 18 and three. And I think they're going at a record pace for net rating, certainly the highest of any five man group over the last 25 years or so. Um, but I mean, it just, it seems like at the moment on the, on the defensive end, there's no weakness there. And it's been like that for a couple months now. And it seems like the offense is, is finally coming up, coming around as well. Um, they're uh, finding better shots. They're not dribbling as much. So, I mean, it all seems to be coming together finally. It is. And like, to your point on like the, the starting five defense, you could see, I mean, Brooklyn obviously was very undermanned on Thursday night, but you could see them just like run their offense at points in that game and just be like it going absolutely nowhere because the Celtics switching and the the defenders they have on the floor, it's just like, okay, great. Yeah. You just like did a dribble handoff, like right into smart. And now you're being led into right into like Brown or or Horford, whoever. Yeah. And then it's like, and now there's five seconds in the shot clock and you're, you're kind of all out of luck at that point. And I think a lot of people are pointing out how, you know, they're beating up on undermanned teams or bad teams. But I mean, if you watch them play, it's clear that their connectivity on the defensive end, I mean, it would be working against any team right now. Right. Um, it's just, there's no real getting through to them. Like I said, there's no weakness. It's five guys that can switch. You got Rob in the back there who just makes it, easier on everybody so I mean you can say that they're beating up on bad teams but earlier in the season they weren't doing that um and they they weren't holding on to these leads like they are now so it's clear that they're they've made a ton of progress there there's no question about that and you look at I mean from the I mean you you had the stat last night I think this is the first time in NBA history a team on the I know the NBA the TNT broadcast had the the plus 25 yeah, first team in NBA history to hit that 25 point marker for four road games in a row, but, and they didn't get it, but Taylor was on the spot said, you know what? doesn't matter. 23 plus 23 <laughs> 23 points, points yeah. or more. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if uh, Aaron Neesmith knew about that record dribbled out the uh, shot clock there, but I don't think they would have been happy at him for taking a shot, but um, yeah, I mean, and not just that, it's uh, the other stat I tweeted out, which is one of the most absurd stats I've seen in a while was, how they've had they haven't they haven't trailed on the road all month. They've had five straight wire to wire wins. Um, the last deficit they faced on the road was January 29th in New Orleans when they went down two to nothing. So essentially six straight wire to wire wins. Um, but I mean, I don't care who you're playing or how hot you are. That's just unheard of. Especially like especially because first basket of the game is kind of up for grabs anyway. So the fact that they got first basket in each of those games and hung on to the lead uh, is just insane i mean that has to be a record especially doing it on the road yeah that that's just absolutely I mean, in today's nba it that just doesn't happen period right. and then because playing in detroit tomorrow indy on sunday they could keep that going for sure right 
even though I don't know the Pistons, this this new the a healthy Piston squad suddenly looks like okay, this is you know they can at least they, you know they beat the Cavs the other night, so that's that's not yeah. going to be they're not they're certainly not the worst team in the NBA right now, despite their record. They've yeah they've had the the tendency to beat good teams really throughout the season, but now it seems like things are kind of coming together. Obviously, Kate Cunningham is looking really good lately. Um, but yeah, that, that loss before the break obviously hurt a little bit, but, um, at the same time, I don't think it, it's always such a bad thing dropping a game right before the break. Cause it kind of festers in your mind for a week. And, you know, they came back to practice Wednesday, Al Horford said everybody was really focused and carried into shoot around and carried into the game. So they look like the same dominant team, the Celtics last night. Yeah. And I actually wrote about this last night a little bit, just in terms of, um, I think, Ime Udoka has kind of flown on the radar and within this like stretch, you know, everything is coming together around the court, but, you know, I think Ime, you know, you know, in the, it was up and down the first couple months of the season for everyone, I think, you know, on the roster. And sometimes, you know, people went after coaching decisions a little bit, but I think in this stretch, the, the level of urgency in these games, like in the stat you just talked about, like if you were leading five straight games, I like that tells you a lot of just about how strong that buy-in is right now with yeah. him. And, he just seems between that and the the defensive tweaks, I think he's kind of worked in uh, with with Rob kind of at the rover and you know sticking with a tighter rotation. It just seems like he's he's pushing all the right buttons right now. Yeah, it's, to your point, I mean, it seems like you know when a team's doing bad, the coach is always one getting the heat, but when they're doing well, they don't really get enough credit. And I think that it was he was facing kind of some unfair criticism at the start. Uh, people were getting a little impatient, which I know it's it's Boston. People get a little impatient when teams aren't winning consistently, but um, you know he he faced a good amount of adversity at the, at the start, just with all the the health issues and you know implementing a new system. I mean that takes time, but I mean he's he's clearly improved as uh, has gone on, just like a bunch of these players have. So he he deserves just as much of the credit. And now. You know, coming out of the trade deadline, it looks like he's also going to have some more options now with yeah. in terms of night lately. He has, you know, obviously Derek White has slotted in. I think everyone, you know, everyone has to be as pleased of the fit as you would hope for. You know, honestly, even like working it better than you could imagine out of the gate. And that's probably just a, a tribute to why as a player and obviously him knowing Ime before. So knowing what he, what he wants. But you have him, you have Grant Williams. And then off the bench now you have, you know, Payne Pritchard or Aaron Neesmith, I feel like that's going to be an interesting, you know, choice on a nightly basis in terms of matchups or whoever, you know, kind of has it going. And then you have some extra depth in Daniel Tice, who who didn't play until, you know, late against the Nets. But that's certainly a player that I think when you're looking at minutes for Al Horford and Rob Williams going forward, like I'm guessing that he's going to be a, in that rotation more often than not just to keep those guys uh, healthy during the stretch run here right yeah and, and we didn't really see much of Daniel last night until garbage time but um you know with I mean obviously Horford's an older guy and Rob's had some injury issues so there's I mean you never know what could happen they, they could need him down the stretch and he's a guy that will should be able to slide right in I mean his versatility fits right in on the with what they do on the defensive end um but yeah, I mean, their their top seven right now is 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 set in stone. It's kind of a question of who's going to be that that eighth guy that steps up. Uh, you know, will be Pritchard or Neesmith. I know they've both had a couple of solid games lately, um, but it'd be great to see one or both of those guys get hot now at the end of the season. How pumped do you think Tice was just after this trade? In terms of like you go from you go from Houston, where things obviously just didn't work for him. Like it was a kind of a weird signing for them in the first place this off season, because they're obviously going very young and, and had a bunch of bigs regardless. Um, yeah. I mean, he, he clearly didn't want to leave to begin with. I mean, he loved it here and so many of the guys loved him. I know Rob, Rob loves him and uh, Tatum. And, uh, but I mean, to go from that situation in Houston, I mean, it's like night and day coming from that organization to this one. And um you know, I think it's it's a special place for him just because the Celtics, you know, found him overseas, gave him a chance. So I think he has, you know, uh, special ties and really appreciates this organization. What have your written impressions of White so far? 
Um, I mean, I think he's been a great fit so far. Uh, you know, I know first half of the season, Dennis and Josh both, uh, you know, they both made solid contributions and Josh was a, was, you know, I would say he was a, a, a surprise and how well he played on both ends of the floor. But I think Derek, um, he, he just, he adds a little bit more offensive versatility. Um, you know, his playmaking should be, uh, you know, big for them in the playoffs and, and down the stretch and, you know, defensively, you know, I, I don't think I, I was even aware just how strong he was on that end. And I, you know, it seems like smart is really excited to play with him uh, in the backcourt. And I mean, he just makes that defense so much stronger, um, especially at the end of games. Yeah. I'm with you on that. I feel like he was in on the defense of white. He never played on any like the great teams in San Antonio. I feel like he feel like he just missed that. Yeah. And so, I mean, he played on, you know, he's played in the playoffs a few times and obviously they've been kind of moving more into rebuilding mode down there in recent years. Um, so he played, I think, with like DeRozan, some guys, maybe a year of Kawhi, but they were probably hurt that year. But the, the Spurs just have never been a great defense in the last like four or five years. So you like, I feel like it's easy for guys like that just to get lost in the shovel. But then, you know, you realize, yeah, he was on that World Cup team in like whatever it was, 2019. And there's a reason for that. And you can yeah. clearly see now, like in terms of, like, of, of a glue guy, um, that yeah, he's not gonna, you know, do anything numbers aren't going to jump off the page by any means but if you if you want just that kind of ability to fit in on either end of the floor yeah like, oh yeah this this works and you know funny thing was how um before january the celtics had never made a trade with san antonio it was the only team that they'd, <laughs> they'd never made a trade with and then they've made two in the past month because that's where they sent juancho right uh, and you know it's just clearly um I think I think White was maybe an underrated part of that San Antonio team. Like you said, his defense kind of flew under the radar. And, you know, obviously Ime was in tune to what he is capable of having been there since since uh Derek came into the league. Um and he's a guy who's really uh I mean he's got he's got a great background as well. I know he started out at a D three school and uh, you know, for for three years uh before going to D one for his last year and then made it to the NBA. So um, you know, he's clearly a, a hard worker and I know Ime appreciates those, those types of players. Yeah, it's pretty good intel. I mean, the fact that Ime has been around a league so much in the last, you know, all these, whether it's San Antonio, Philadelphia or Brooklyn in the last three years, you can get a lot of, you know, just when you're making moves for guys, it's a pretty useful tool to have just that yeah. like, oh yeah, let's just go <laughs> talk to Ime. Let's see what he, what kind of guy Derek is. Yeah. Yeah. He had him for four years, whatever, for sure. but it's. It's going to be, and one thing I do like, and to, I think to Emei's credit during this run is that there was no, he just threw him in the deep end from like yeah. day one out of the game. And that's, I feel like some coaches, even so if you know a guy like are a little hesitant with that, like, okay, like let's, you know, we don't want to throw him in crunch time. Like let's, you know, he doesn't know the plays or whatever yet. Like let's kind of ease him in a little bit, but even in, you know, against the the nuggets and the Hawks that, the weekend after the trade deadline, it was like, nope, like we're, we're going to roll with him for the last like 18 minutes of these games. And he kind of, and those are all these games are really important for them at this point from a standing standpoint, because they have so much, you know, ground to make up in the tight Eastern conference. So that, that them being able to kind of pull that off seemed to is, could come in handy really big time in the, in the long run here. I think, I think we were all kind of shocked that he, he played right off the bat too. Cause I mean, I remember, like I didn't, I didn't find out until like 15 minutes before. Oh yeah, that's right. They were waiting on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because like all the the physical stuff had to go through, and oftentimes even then, you know, a guy won't be thrown right in there. Certainly not for you know whatever he played 25 minutes or so. Um, but yeah, I mean, it helps that you know he knows uh, he knows how Ime is as a coach, and and also just you know having played with some of these guys a little bit in the past with Team USA. I mean, he, it's not like he was going into like a foreign locker room. Um, and I mean, he just, he went in his first game, first couple of games, just, uh, you know, hit the ground running and, um, you know, he's, he's clearly a very, you know, he's got a high basketball IQ. So, you know, it doesn't surprise me that a guy like that would, would be able to uh, do so well so quickly with the team. All right, Taylor. So right now the Celtics, as we record this, are just one game 
out of the the fifth seed right now, I believe they're just they're closing in on the Cleveland Cavaliers. Yeah. I know they're they're in sixth right now. By the end of the weekend, if everything goes perfectly, they could be third. Um, right. So you know it's it's crazy how tight it is right now. It is. So you have the Bulls and the Heat are up top um, with a four and a four and five and have game edged over the Celtics. But behind that, the 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 Bucks, the Sixers, the Cavs are all kind of crushed together there just ahead of the Celtics here. We just found out today the Raptors are right behind the Celtics, but OG Ananobi has uh, a broken finger apparently, so his status moving forward is in question. We know Brooklyn is going to get a, a lot healthier soon, but the timetable on those guys returning to the floor is still unclear, and and their schedule is not easy coming up for, for the Nets there. They're playing on Toronto and a lot of other tough teams. So, um, yeah. I know that they, the Celtics have one of the easier schedules, I believe. Right. This season. That's that's going to obviously help them out. So what do you think, realistically here, what do you think, how high do you think the Celtics could get in the East standings here? What, what's, what's, an inta- like, what's an attainable goal for them if they, I mean, obviously if they keep playing like this, like anything is – possible in terms of getting up to two or one but what do you think is realistic with their schedule here i mean just you know the way they've been playing and the, the schedule coming up i i don't see them finishing any lower than than fourth at this point um i mean you know it's the teams at the top uh right now um i'm not sure uh who, who's it i think chicago's dealing with a couple of injuries too um yeah but, they're they're getting a couple guys back like caruso and yeah, um, should be coming back soon. They just uh, and Levine just got back too. Yeah, and I mean, I think you know, a lot a lot of people are still thinking you know it's Brooklyn, Philly, Milwaukee, but you know, the thing with Brooklyn and and Philly, I mean, they have you know they just made these two huge franchise altering moves, and you know they're great players, but you never you don't know how quickly they're going to be able to establish chemistry and and just how those pieces will will fit um and but i mean what we do know is the celtics are rolling right now and this is the type of momentum that could carry on for for quite some time so i mean i think fourth would be like at the at the bottom i think for me but i mean it's it's so close all the way to the top that i mean they they could finish uh you know second first maybe and we talk about that schedule like after this road trip this weekend here they don't really have one. They have only two major road trips throughout the season. One is that West Coast trip in the middle of, of March, which starts tough with like Golden State, but then you got Sacramento, Denver, who obviously will probably still be without Murray and Porter at that point, and OKC. So that's you know a two and two or three and one trip there is very within the realm of possibility. And then you go to the last week of the year, the the probably the toughest trip of the year, the Chicago, Milwaukee, Memphis, but. At that point, you wonder with seeding in both conferences whether th- that'll be locked up for any of those teams involved, and that could you know make those games like obviously not as as tough as they would be in the middle of the year. Yeah, yeah, I think um, you know the Celtics were fortunate to get such a uh, difficult portion of their schedule out of the way in December. I mean, that was like a ridiculous month. I think every single team they faced was five hundred or above, and yeah, you know, obviously it killed them because I mean they didn't they were depleted with injuries and, and health issues and, you know, it showed in, in their record that month, but um, it's, it should pay off hopefully the, you know, the last part of the year for them. And what do you, I mean, you look at the playoff picture right now, where, what kind of, you know, matchup do you think, what kind of path do you think could work for the Celtics in terms of fear? We're going to have obviously months and months to look at this stuff, but Beyond like part of it's like, oh, yeah, that'd be good to get Cleveland or Chicago. But then you look at the way like Chicago's playing this year and the way DeRozan's playing. It's like, oh, I don't know, like you can ask for a team like that, like in yeah. a first or second round matchup. Like I, I, it's 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 so tight right now. It's going to be I think they'll be lucky if they get a, a favorable first bout matchup at all, if even if they're yeah. get that three or four seed. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really it's tough to gauge the competition this year just because of how. You know, I mean, so many teams have been inconsistent and, you know, standings are are so tight. I mean, I think most people wouldn't want to face those, you know, those powerhouses like Brooklyn or or Philly or uh, Milwaukee right off the bat. But, um, 
I mean, Cleveland, I, I know there wasn't much, weren't much expectations for Cleveland coming in, but they, they've been kind of a little scary this year. Uh, I mean, with uh, Jared Allen and, and Mobley up front and, you know, even, even all the injuries they've, they've dealt with. Um, I mean, that would, that would be a, a tough matchup, but um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's hard to say, like, you can't really be certain about any matchup going in. You really can't. It's, and I mean, you, who knows what these teams are going to look like. I mean, we'll have a lot more to go off of in the coming weeks as, you know, Philly starts to look like themselves. Brooklyn gets all these guys back. I will be very curious to see just how those guys integrate into the fold. And then Chicago, like Lonzo Ball is another guy too, that's supposed to come back for them. So that's all these teams could look and be playing a lot different from there. But the Celtics to the crowd, like they, they have everything they need right now. Like white, I think as as far as an addition goes is as easy as to slot in as probably any player in the league, given his background of the and just the, the type of player he is. And, you know, and we already talked about Tice, like Tice, you know, it might be a new system for him, but he knows how to play with all these guys already. So that, that kind of learning curve, you know, I wonder how much that kind of factored into Brad Stevens decision-making at the trade deadline being like, when he decided to pull the trigger on him at the last minute, like, Hey, this is, we know this guy, but we also know that like, there's not going to be a learning curve of him either bringing him back in here. Yeah. And I mean, you know, some of these teams might have bigger stars or whatever, but I think I can't think of a, like a deeper six or seven man rotation than what the Celtics have. And then, um, you know, Tatum tends to come on strong at the end of the season too. So, I mean, if, if they're healthy, I mean, last year, as we knew, they, uh, you know, were, were without Jalen in the playoffs. They, uh, Rob was dealing with health issues. But, I mean, if you got this team fully healthy going into the playoffs, I don't think any team would feel comfortable facing them. What else What else has stood out to you or surprised you, if anything, about this team in the last six weeks here? I mean, we know, you know, the the defense has been historic numbers. We know the starting five numbers have been kind of out of control. But has anyone within that group, when you, like, have kind of dug into the numbers, really – been like wow this is like i didn't expect this from this guy at least yet um i mean at this point it's not surprising me as much but just just to see how uh, rob continues to grow i mean i i feel like his presence is a little underappreciated or well not 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 with it you know i mean celtics fans love him i know um you know, I don't want to step into Forsberg's. <laughs> yeah, no, like, Forsberg's going to come after you now. No, just, <laughs> but we haven't mentioned him in this podcast, which I think is also to, to, to your point. Like he, it is kind of taking it for granted at this point. Like, oh yeah, just uh, just another double double last night. Yeah, like, oh, um. but it's just I don't know if it's it's that widely noticed yet around the league just how valuable he is. I mean, Tatum is obviously the best player on this team, the MVP of this team, but it seems like Rob has been kind of the most important piece or the the x factor just because when he's out there the defense just seems to be so much more intense and locked in and you know Marcus was saying yesterday how having Rob in there as a rim protector just just really makes everybody else's job easier because they can you know pressure on the perimeter and you know rely on him up in the back but um it's just he just keeps getting better and better and I think it's gonna it would be a, uh, a a crime if he didn't make one of the all defensive teams at this point, just being, you know, the most, probably the most important defensive player on the best defensive team. Yeah. I mean, this, this year, you know, that voting will be fascinating if the, if they make it up to number one in, in team defense, like obviously like smart, see, it feels like a given, but then you look at Rob, you look at, I think even like Tatum, I mean, you could make a case honestly for any, like, you know, yeah, I mean the, the entire starting group is just elite defenders, and right. you know I don't I don't I know uh, Smart gets a lot of the credit and deservedly so. I mean he's one of the best, but um, you know Tatum and Brown are both elite perimeter defenders as well. Um, and I know Tatum at the beginning of the season said his goal was to uh, make all defensive team, and and he he actually leads the league in defensive win shares this year. So I mean he's he's doing his job on that end as well. And, Rob, I mean, Rob Williams' most improved player is that, I mean, he was really good last year, so it's kind of like, well, 
Like the numbers aren't that much change except the fact that he's playing so much more, but yeah, I mean, when you look at the numbers, you wouldn't you wouldn't think it. I mean, his numbers have improved obviously, but you know, usually most improved a guy will, you know, his points will go up by 10 or something like that, but just in terms of his impact, I think that's what should, you know, be considered um cuz it's just like I said there's there's so much better when he's out there and, you know, giving him this increase in minutes this season has just made so much of a difference in his development too. That honestly had prize like one of the biggest surprises for me that he's been able to handle those, like the minute load. Yeah. Like, it, it is, it is, it is skyrocketed and he's been able to stay out on the court. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you know, as we all know, he's, he's dealt with some injury issues in the past and, you know, he's had a, a few, um, you know, nicks and bruises this year, but he, he hasn't really, you know, missed, a lot of time like consecutive games or anything like that and I think he may was saying yesterday how he seems to you know with this extra workload he's kind of built up more of a of a tolerance that kind of stuff um so I mean that's that's huge I mean having him healthy is 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 so critical for them if they want to make a deep run and well we're gonna see what what happens here we got I think what 20 21 games left here um It'll continue again this week. They'll be coming fast and furious, and we'll be seeing if they can push their way back up to the the top half of the Eastern Conference playoff picture down the stretch here. But I want to thank Taylor to, for hopping on. Make sure you're following him at Twitter, at Taylor C. Snow. You know, he's got important people like Jason Tw- Tatum retweeting his stuff regularly. So, um, you know, he, he's well worth the follow. Make sure you hit him up on there. All right. Thanks, be Rob. <laughs> <laughs> but in I'm the meantime, yep, nope. Couldn't, we'll be, couldn't have uh, spent the snowy day in a, any better way. <laughs> exactly. This is what this is what snowy days are for. Not shoveling, just podcasting instead. But make sure you rate, review, subscribe to the Winning Plays Pod. Um, you can follow us on Twitter as well at Winning Plays Pod. And we'll be catch up with you guys again next week. <laughs>